Okay, okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear me, so that's a good sign. Um, my name is Maya Vinokur. Uh, I teach uh, here in the Department of Russian and Slavic Studies, and I also co-organize with Leif Weatherby, who's conveniently here in the audience, and AJ Bauer, um, the working group on the global new right at the IPK. Um, thank you so much to the IPK for helping make this event possible. Um, and thanks especially to Jess, Victor, Sam, and Isabel for doing technical and logistical support. Um, our speaker today is Elizabeth Sandifer, uh, a writer, anarchist, and occultist from Ithaca, New York. She is a former academic who got her PhD at the University of Florida doing film and media studies. Her works include Tardis Eruditorum, a multi-volume critical history of Doctor Who, Last War in Albion, which reimagines the history of British comic books as magical warfare, Britain, a prophecy, uh, a foray into comic book writing that uh, triumphantly decapitates Margaret Thatcher at the end of the first issue. Um, she is a blogger and publisher of the avant-garde leftist media criticism site, Eruditorum Press. And finally, she has asked me to introduce her as, quote, basically just a crazed queer stoner engaged in an elaborate and frankly supervillain-like scheme to transform human consciousness or possibly just pay her rent. Uh, her talk today centers on her book, Neo Reaction, a Basilisk, which came out, I believe, in 2017 with Eruditorum Press. Um, please join me in welcoming Elizabeth. Let us assume that we are fucked. It's a pretty good assumption at this point. I mean, the fundamental math looks bad. Liberal democracy is ineptly fighting off a fascism that is at this point less creeping than metastasizing, and meanwhile, the planet is cooking. The smart money is probably on a massive human dieback in which billions of people die and the, ah, and the human population drops precipitously. This is less going to happen in our lifetimes than it's going to happen to our lifetimes. And it's in that context that I'd like to say, good evening, I'm Elizabeth Sandifer, and I'm here to talk about my book, Near Reaction to Basilisk. I want to start by saying how fundamentally delightful it is to be talking about Near Reaction to Basilisk in an academic setting. I started this book in 2015 when I was living with my wife in Danbury, Connecticut. I'd graduated from my PhD program five years earlier, I'd been dashed on the rocks of the academic job market and the humanities, and I'd found to my mild alarm that I could actually make more money writing a lengthy critical history of the classic British television series Doctor Who than I could adjuncting. Eventually, after a few years, I finally ran out of Doctor Who to write about, and I had to start writing other sorts of criticism and self-publishing it. And so I found myself in this strange position of, do, of still doing scholarship and research, but on my own terms with the people I had to impress being a couple hundred people on Patreon or Kickstarter, instead of some peer reviewer whose main concern was going to be whether I cited his work. Uh, which in practice meant that I started doing much weirder stuff. Uh, like I say, critical history of Doctor Who, but what I really mean is one that sort of lapsed into the occult edges of psychedelia during the 1960s and uh, did one entry in the 1980s as a choose-your-own-adventure story about Kabbalistic interpretations of, of the uh, ropey British sci-fi show. And I'm learning lessons about how quickly to turn my pages. So it's 2015, and I read an article about this guy named Nick Land, who, to make a long and extremely weird story into a short and extremely weird story, was a cyberpunk nihilist philosophy at the University of Warwick's Cybernetic Culture Research Unit, who did absolutely astonishing amounts of drugs, went completely mad, moved to China, and became a fascist. But he was a really weird one who seemed to think that the point of fascism is to bring about a technological singularity that would annihilate humanity, which struck me as broadly interesting. In hindsight, this is clearly resonating with my own academic crash out and general nihilist worldview, but you know, ideas come from where they were, come from. So Land had written a bunch about another guy I was already vaguely familiar with, a software developer turned blogger named Mencius Moldbug, who advocated for a return to absolute monarchy under the philosophical banner of neo-reaction, which should be understood the same way that someone says that their bedroom band makes dungeon synth. Um, after looking at this article, I could see that Land was also really influenced by this guy named Eliezer Yudkowsky, who's this crackpot self-proclaimed AI research whose fantasies about the AI singularity are weirdly influential even though they are more or less completely ungrounded in anything recognizable as actual computer science. And interestingly, Moldbug had gotten his start writing on Eliezer Yudkowsky's website, so I had this sort of neat web of connections among these three weirdos, and I thought, 
you know, there's probably an essay here. I'll write it up. I'll put it on the blog. And I started in on it. I described my three main figures, and I went word count, and I went, oh, I've written 9,000 words. So I went, well, shit, apparently I'm not writing an essay, I'm writing a book. Uh, my wife was working nights at the time, and Neo Reaction to Basilisk was mostly written while she was out at work, on my laptop, in my bed, generally quite stoned. Uh, early on in the process, I tried to describe what it was I was doing to her, and uh, she looked at me like I had three heads and told me this was the single least commercial idea I'd ever had, and shouldn't I go write something that anyone would actually buy? Uh, and I want to stress, the baseline again was occultism and Doctor Who, so... This was the book, though, that was living in my head, and it was obsessing me, and I had a very accommodating weed dealer, so I wrote it. Uh, I gave the manuscript out to some people and kind of hyped it up on the internet, and then I ran a Kickstarter. I promoted it on my blog, and by loudly arguing with all of the people I was writing about, most of whom I'd circulated the manuscript around so they could yell back and make a lot of noise, and it all worked out. Um, I made 16 grand on the Kickstarter. My wife and I moved from Danbury to Ithaca, New York, and uh, we live there today with our other wife and our husband, and we don't use our birth pronouns. It's all very cute. Uh, I got the version that's on sale now out in late 2017. Uh, it consisted of the title essay, Neo Reaction to Basilisk, and a couple additional essays I wrote after the Kickstarter. Uh, and that version has sort of become a pleasantly successful cult hit that sells well enough that, you know, you can make a rib roast for your Yule dinner and know that the royalties from Christmas sales are going to cover it nicely. Uh, you know, that, that nice low range of academic success or sort of quasi-academic success. Uh, but it's apparently such a cult hit that I've been invited back out of the frozen wilderness of ex-academia to this reputable university to talk about what is now a five-year-old book. So like I said, it is delightful to be here. Uh, the idea that something like Neo Reaction to Basilisk, which is a book that is more or less just five bad ideas in a trench coat, can get this sort of institutional respect and acclaim is just delightful to me. Uh, so what I'd like to do today is basically two things. First, I want to talk a little bit more about what this book is, because it's very much a book that comes out of my academic training, but it's also a book where I did a lot of things that I knew I would never get away with in academia. Uh, and that seems worth talking about. Uh, I also want to talk about what's changed since I wrote the book, because unfortunately, the past five years have not been uneventful in the rise of fascism. Uh, so the first thing I realized when I was trying to write a book about esoteric Nazi philosophy uh, was that the idea that anyone would want to ever read it, uh, to do that you really have to make it fun on an almost sentence level. And the easiest way to make something fun on a sentence level is to add jokes to it. Uh, I've described the tone of Neo Reaction to Basilisk as being that of an extremely bitchy and sarcastic comment on a web forum. Uh, that main essay about Moldbug, Yudkowsky, and Land is me writing like I'm just trying to piss off an entire academic list serve full of people um, for about 50,000 words straight. Uh, let me just give an example. This is from early on in the book uh, when I'm introducing Mencius Moldbug, although I introduce him by his real name, not his pen name, Curtis Yarvin. These days, Yarvin is best known as the founder of Urbit, a startup tech company providing, in its own words, a secure peer-to-peer -peer network of personal servers built on a clean slate system software stack. Or, perhaps more accurately, he's best known for the astonishing levels of protests that take place whenever a tech conference invites him to speak, generally based on the accusation that he believes in reinstituting slavery and thinks that black people are genetically predisposed to making good slaves. Uh, the reason for this is relatively simple, which is that he believes in reinstituting slavery and he thinks that black people are genetically predisposed to making especially good slaves. This remarkable claim, along with many others, came during his several year tenure blogging under the name Mencius Moldbug on his website Unqualified Reservations, although it is worth noting that one of the sites where he got his start as a commentator was on Overcoming Bias, i.e. where Yudkowsky was writing. Moldbug is a long-winded blogger. Even his standalone posts are quite long, and his major works constitute multiple posts, most notably the 14-part and open letter to open-minded progressives, which we'll get to in a moment. But if one wants to see the basic appeal of Moldbug, one must turn to his considerably shorter A Gentle Introduction to Unqualified Reservations, a mere nine-parter although the ninth part is in three subparts, with a fourth having inflated to a book and then seemingly defeated its writer never to be published. New you are, readers, he proclaims at the start. Unfortunately, I'm lying. There is no such thing as a gentle introduction to you are. It's like talking about a mild DMT trip. If it was mild, it wasn't DMT. The appeal of this is obvious. Moldbug is out of his fucking skull. 
Listen to this shit. After he proclaims that he's going to give readers a mark matrix-like red pill, not quite the one offered by the MRAs, but Moldbug is where they got the term red pilled from. Quote, our genuine red pill is not ready for the mass market. It is the size of a golf ball, though nowhere near so smooth, and halfway down it splits in half and exposes a sodium metal core which will sear your throat like a live coal. There will be scarring. I want to be clear with all possible sincerity that I love the braggadocio here. I want what he is selling. Yes, Mencius, savagely tear away the veil of lies with which I cope with the abject horror that is reality and reveal to me the awful agonizing truth of being. Give me the red pill. The problem is... Once we get our golf ball-sized reality distortion pill home, put on some Leibach, and settle, for an epic, settle in for an epic bout of Thanatosian psychedelia, we discover the unfortunate truth, which is that we're actually just huffing paint in an unhygienic gas station bathroom. Jesus, this isn't even bath country. This, let's call it sassy tone of the essay, did a couple of things. First of all, as I noted, it just makes the material a bit more fun. I had also made sure there was never any danger of accidentally making these bozos look at all credible, which is a real problem with writing about them because I really want to stress they're terrible people. And just being unrelentingly mean to them through the entire book did, I think, a lot to make sure that it was never possible to be inadvertently seduced by the searing sodium metal core of the red pill or whatever other shit they say while literally arguing for slavery. Uh, the other important part of the book was its structure, which is... Look, I mentioned that I was very high when I wrote this, right? Uh, the queer theory, gr theorist Grace Lavery has argued for the distinction between weed philosophy and coke philosophy, which I think is one of the better uh, metrics you can use to look at philosophy. This is definitely a book of weed philosophy. It's got that kind of classic stoner paranoia structure. Uh, it opens with a quote from the classic children's book, The Monster at the End of This Book, uh, which if you know the book, you kind of see where I'm going. And if you don't, I don't want to spoil the best children's book ever written for you. Uh, but there is a monster at the end of it. Uh, it's very much playing with the idea that it's this wandering train of thought that's probably going to end up somewhere really dark and horrifying, and so it just sort of spends its whole time waiting for this horrible realization to hit. Uh, that's what the basilisk of the title is referring to, actually. It's a riff on a concept from Elisa Yudkowsky's weird AI cult called Roko's Basilisk. Well, less a concept than a really funny and weird thing that happened to them once. All right, so this AI cult wants to bring about the reign of a benevolent, godlike AI who is going to fix everything forever and reincarnate them as software on its servers so that they can live forever in rational perfection as a hybrid of man and machine, right? So this guy using the handle of Roko makes a post theorizing that someday the godlike AI might be created and decide that it should just reincarnate everyone ever who didn't actively work to bring it about, um, just reincarnate them on its servers, and then torture them for all eternity as punishment for not creating it. So once you've accidentally imagined this AI as a thing that uh, could exist, uh, you're obliged to give all of your money and effort to bringing it about, or else otherwise it's going to torture you. Now, I want to stress this is very, very stupid. And if it makes absolutely no sense to you, that speaks well of you. But it was stupid in a way that followed very faithfully from the weird bullshit ideas that these people believed in in the first place. And it freaked a bunch of them the fuck out until Yudkowsky himself was reduced to posting in all, all caps rants about how the worst thing you can possibly do with a harmful idea is to talk about it. So two things here. First, I want to stress how utterly delighted I then was when Yudkowsky said that nobody should ever talk about my book. Uh... Talk about the best promotion a gal can ask for. Second of all, though, I want to highlight this basic idea of a harmful idea, this thing that you can just think that objectively makes your life worse the moment you think about it. That's why it's called a basilisk. If you accidentally look at it, you're screwed, right? And I want to stress that this is a particular danger for philosophy. You know, that's the central dynamic of horror in the book. It's a philosophy book that treats the idea of a basilisk as something that's surely lurking around some corner of intellectual exploration. And this was largely in line with the stuff that was popular in 2015. That was the year after True Detective had just popularized Thomas Ligotti a little bit. It was right when Eugene Thacker was finding some acclaim and success with his horror and philosophy series. You know, you can uh, see it in Moldbug's kind of swaggering description of the red pill, too. Uh, more to the point, Nick Land was dabbling in it. He had written a couple of vaguely fascist comic horror novellas. So I decided to play with it, too, and give the whole book the sort of horror philosophy vibe. 
Uh, I could read another bit of the main essay here to illustrate this, but let's flip forward to one of the backing essays. Theses on a President. Uh, this was written in um, as, as a series of numbered sections, uh, each a couple paragraphs apiece, so I'm going to jump in on section eight, uh, with a section about Donald Trump's early real estate days in New York City. Eight. As a geographic trajectory, this was as fortuitous as it was inevitable. New York City was on the slow slide from being told to drop dead by Gerald Ford to a summer of blackouts and arson, and Manhattan was an object of faded glory. His target benefited this, the Commodore Hotel, a crumbling relic of the Gilded Age across from Grand Central Station, once called the most beautiful lobby in all the world, where John McIntyre Bowman had once hosted a circus, elephants and all, on nothing more than a whim upon hearing the offhand comment of a guest. Now a ba bankrupted rat trap in a seedy outcrop of Times Square's porn district, its occupancy hovering at 50% with a brothel taking up retail space on the second floor. The strategy was characteristic. A gut renovation would rip out everything but a single foyer, while the brick elevator would get a glass, a brick uh, exterior would get a glass facade. The illusion of the contemporary bolted onto the classically modern. Central to the project, however, was a wealth of familial connections, mostly cultivated through his father. Perhaps most importantly was New York Mayor Abe Beam, the sort of man who clapped his arms around him and his father at a meeting and proclaimed, whatever my friends want in this town, they get. In this case, what they wanted was a bill to pass through the state legislature that would provide for a 20-year tax abatement for projects such as the hotel, which would become a Grand Hyatt. The bill faltered, however, and so he turned to the same honor... Uh, time-honored tactic of the rich and fell upwards, hatching a scheme to use the state's urban development corporation to buy, back, buy the property for a dollar and then lease it back tax-free for 40 years instead. And it's here that his father's connections become truly crucial, as otherwise he'd have completely fucked the deal when he walked into UDC Richard Ravitch's, uh, head Richard Ravitch's office for a meeting and when Ravitch offered a lesser deal than he wanted, threatened to have him fired. But Pressure from Beam and City Hall eventually turned Ravitch around, and with typical regard for the truth, he went on to claim that he'd gotten the 40-year abatement, quote, because I didn't ask for 50. But the dependence on his father's connections didn't stop there. It was Fred who guaranteed the $70 million construction loan and who secured an additional $65 million from Chase when the project went over budget. Nine. Of the numerous cronies surrounding the Grand Hyatt deal, however, one stands out. The point of the UDC when it was created in the 1960s was to develop racially integrated housing. And so there is a particularly rich irony in the fact that one of the key brokers of the deal was Roy Cohn, whose association with the family had begun when he re represented them in a federal lawsuit that, they alleged that, uh, that alleged that they were offering different rental terms and falsely claiming to have no vacancies when blacks inquired about apartments in 39 separate buildings across the city. The significance of Cohn's mentorship is an understandably popular angle on our subject. His influence echoes on long after his death. Roger Stone and Paul Manafort were both friends of Cohn's. And beyond that, Cohn is a legendarily repulsive figure. He was in many ways the archetype of the unscrupulous pit, pit bull attorney, a man who never once was troubled by principles or shame and who represented his clients with ruthless, ruthless bluster and a stunning gift for hypocrisy. But more appealing is, the simple, is simply the bizarre scope of his career. He came to prominence in 1951 when, one, when he threatened David Greenglass into perjuring himself testifying against his sister Ethel Rosenberg. This launched him into becoming chief counsel to Joseph McCarthy on the recommendation of J. Edgar Hoover. There, he became the primary architect of the Red Scare and helped convince Dwight Eisenhower to ban the federal employment of homosexuals before finally being forced out in disgrace after McCarthy was censured. He returned to New York and continued a law career there, representing at various times the Roman Catholic Church, the New York Yankees, John Gotti, and Studio 54. And then, for good measure, he posthumously became one of the main characters in Tony Kushner's Angels in America, which portrayed his last days dying of AIDS and visit, uh, vigorously remaining in the closet. He was memorably played by Al Pacino in the HBO adaptation. He is perhaps the only character in this tale as singular as the man himself, a ragged scar against the post-war American half-century, the closest thing to an external explanation that exists. He was, of course, kicked to the curb the moment his diagnosis became clear. 10. Having made his foothold in Manhattan, he set upon his signature set piece, the tower. 
It is a cliche to note that the skyscraper's architecture is largely about fucking the sky. In Western culture, at least, this is fundamentally homoerotic, the sky being a traditionally patriarchal figure. As is usually the case with him, this bluntly Freudian approach pays clear-cut dividends, forming a shockingly robust explanation for his actions. What it misses, however, is the foaming excess of it. The tower's serrated design does not merely make, serve to make it look bigger than it is. It makes it so that it appears to fuck the sky with an animalistically barbed penis, its jagging teeth, jagged teeth biting in so that the firmament can't escape. More broadly, the tower applies the principles of Tudor revivalism to the skyscraper. The word du jour of 1980s architectural critics was tacky, which is hardly inaccurate, especially once one gets a glimpse of the lobby, but it also serves to miss the point, encoding a judgment of taste rooted in aesthetic values that are simply not meaningfully in play. It is more accurate to say that it makes a very pure commitment to the visual essence of the skyscraper while remaining weirdly indifferent to context or function. The tower, in other words, cares more about looking like a skyscraper than being one. 11. This preposterous structure marks what is possibly the most important transition in his life. Up to its completion in 1983, it is basically possible to understand him as a human being in the traditional sense. His motivations in building it, its basic aesthetics, even most of the idiosyncrasies of its construction, all of these things make up a perfectly understanding pathology, a sort of Charles Foster Kane figure whose psyche might be summed up in some single magical word. He might have even had a name. But then he literally built a 660-foot uh, tall tower to which he offered up that name, sacrificing it upon, the upon its black altar such that it became a titanic sigil of the 16th major arcana of the Tarot of the Golden Dawn, symbolizing destruction and ruin, with only the remnants of the man whose name it ate living within the rotting heart of its penthouse. Like the Hyatt before it, it was built in the ruins of modernism. This time the remains of a fallen department store, Bonwet Teller's 1930 flagship store, which had famously been dominated by Art Deco reliefs of sphinxes on the exterior walls, which he had initially promised to donate to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, but instead, perhaps realizing the cost, perhaps out of an, an always intended switcheroo, he simply had them destroyed in the night, literally jackhammering the goddess into the ground to build the tower on her corpse, a ruined modernism. Twelve. So you can't exactly call the eventual divorce a surprise. Still, this inevitable consequence hurts, if only because it's expressed in terms he understands, a demand for cash predicated on his infidelity. It is not an attack on his name, but on his image, a tabloid onslaught in which one of, the, one of his bits on the side provided the famously libel-proof headline, Best Sex of My Life. But there were other losses at the same time. Cohn, of course, along with one of the last lawsuits he filed, an antitrust case against the NFL that not ended in a nominal victory with the deliberately insulting damages of $3, increased to $3.76 due to interest during appeals. Uh, this was also the period where he began his ill-fated expansion into Atlantic City, which would lead to his first round of bankruptcies. But it is the tower that anchors this tradition, this transition, pegged by multiple associates as a, as a turning point in his personality, where he became convinced of his own infallibility. At the heart of it, as Barbara Ress, mar manager on the tower, puts it, was the fact that, quote, he became a celebrity. As he became more famous, he got nastier. A common narrative arc, to be sure, but generally lacking the ruthless efficiency of an architectural black mass to sacrifice your name upon the altar of your image. All right, so at this point, you probably have a good idea of what the book was like and why, and while that's a nice long pat on my back, uh, I'll admit it doesn't ex really explain why this is a book that anyone cared about. If anything, it actually might be the opposite. Uh, but the thing is, for all that the book was a thing... Uh, this was a book in which I was talking about some extremely weird people. It proved pretty prescient. I mean, the Trump stuff was a gimme, although I wrote and posted that essay before the election, back when everyone assumed that Clinton was going to waltz to an easy win. But even the weirder stuff turned out to be on to something. For instance, take that Rocco's Basilisk thing I mentioned. Now, not only has Rocco since come out as an outright Nazi, Rocco's Basilisk was, and I promise I am not making this up, what Elon Musk and Grimes first bonded over on Twitter. 
Uh, Mencius Moldbug, meanwhile, has uh, appeared on Tucker Carlson within the last year and is a major influence on both J.D. Vance and Blake Masters, uh, which is no surprise because both of them, along with Moldbug and Yudkowsky, are funded by Peter Thiel, who, of course, made his money at PayPal with Elon Musk and is advising his Twitter takeover. Uh, the astonishing thing, in other words, is that these really did turn out to be a lot of the fuckheads who are actively destroying the world right now. So what do we do about that? Well, in one sense, I gave the answer at the beginning. Probably not a lot. Probably we die. Like, there are some alternatives, but they're generally of the massive global revolution uh, variety, and those don't seem terribly convincing to me as a thing that happens out of current politics. Uh, if a leftist revolutionary movement was going to happen, I feel like someone other than Willem van Spronson would have been trying, down, trying to tear down the ice camps, you know? If you're asking me for solutions to the world, my suggestions uh, to the end of the world, my suggestions are mostly things like, well, what if we just collectively agreed to drag every billionaire out of their mansion and execute them for crimes against humanity? And we're not doing that, so, you know, good luck. Maybe that voting thing will work this time. Uh, let's do another excerpt from the book. Uh, this is from the very end, a final essay called Zero to Zero, a final spin around the shuddering abyss at the heart of all things. I had a lot of fun with this book. Uh, this is an essay on Peter Thiel, in which I look at some of his philosophical ideas and theories of how business and investment work. Uh, and what I find is that it's really not very good. Uh, actually, his business advice is all incredibly bad. Uh, all of his own financial successes have either come when he ignored his own advice or when he got stupidly lucky despite having a really bad idea. For instance, his idea for PayPal was a Palm Pilot exclusive payment network that he thought would eventually replace the U.S. dollar, uh, which is the rare thing that you can look at and honestly describe as Bitcoin but stupid. <laughs> uh, it only made a lot of money because it turned out to have a real use case, which was that it made eBay functional. Uh, and because of that totally arbitrary stroke, stroke of luck, he now has enough money to fund stupid ideas forever, and so he invests in stuff like a patient-funded medical trial scam to um, obtain immortality by injecting himself with the blood of teenagers. Or, you know, in Elisha Dikowski and Mencius Moldbug. So I lay all of that out in the essay, and then here is how the book ends. So... Our puppet master stands revealed as yet another crackpot spinning a vast and compound web of bad ideas. Who would craft such a thing as the alt-right? Only a fucking idiot. What other answer were we possibly going to find? It has been idiots all the way down. And so, of course, even its billionaire supervillains, uh, bankrolling, world-conquering AIs, vampiric life extension, and Donald Trump are idiots. This borders on A is A. And yet, for all of its obviousness, it captures what is perhaps the key realization about the alt-right, one that has been implicit through much of this book, but that is worth making explicit as we come to a close. They're stupid. I do not suggest this to diminish their horror. Far from it. The essential horror of the abyss is stupidity. That's why it's an abyss. The unique and exquisite danger of stupidity is that by its nature, it is beyond reason. There is nothing that can be said to it because, by definition, it wouldn't understand. It is an ur basilisk the one terrifying possibility haunting every single argument that has ever been made. It is an argumentative move without response, playing, with move, uh, playing by no rules other than its own, which do not generally include any obligation toward consistency. It is, in its way, the only approach that cannot lose an argument. And in the alt-right and its affiliates, we have one of the most staggeringly vast nexuses of raw stupidity that the world has ever crafted. To be clear, my contention is not merely that the alt-right is stupid, nor even that the, its individual adherents are. It is, and they are, but the problem is more fundamental. The alt-right is stupidity. It is the elemental particle of which every part is comprised. To engage in alt-right thinking is to turn oneself into a vacuous skin suit animated by raw stupidity. There is literally not a single shred of non-stupidity in the entire thing. Mencius Moldbug? Stupid. Milo Yiannopoulos? Stupid. Donald Trump? Peter Thiel? Vox Day? Stupid. 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 Neo-reaction is stupid. Race realism is stupid. Austrian economics is stupid. MAGA and Pepe and the da Daily Stormer are stupid. Even Nick Land is only not stupid to the precise extent to which there is some possibility that what he is doing is an elaborate game, and frankly, even that sounds stupid when you say it out loud. 
every single detail of every single aspect of this entire cratering shitstorm in which the human race seems hell-bent on going extinct is absolutely fucking stupid. Nothing follows from this, in all likelihood, literally. We cannot define ourselves in contrast to this tendency and move on because to do so is still to build on a foundation of abyssal stupidity. The event horizon, is, horizon has been breached. There is no longer an outside. A thing cannot be unknown. The only solution is to never encounter these ideas in the first place. Don't look now. It's too late. And broadly speaking, it was. Like, the world hasn't gotten any better since 2017, a time so distant that ending the main essay of the book with the sentence, bioterrorist infected, infect thyself, sounded like a good idea and not like I was endorsing anti-vax conspiracy theories like I was some kind of teal-funded Senate candidate. <laughs> that litany of stupidity didn't even have to include the Capitol building getting stormed by a Viking cosplayer who called himself the QAnon shaman. I, I want to draw, yourself, draw your attention to two headlines I read while eating lunch this weekend. Uh, one of them describes Utah politicians accusing local officials funding drag events of grooming children for transgender Satan worship, a blatant parallel to the protocols of the elders of Zion and the impending genocide of its subjects. Meanwhile, in multiple regions of one of the biggest swing states in the impending Senate election, Nevada, there is a blatant fascist coup brewing with multiple candidates for offices controlling uh, offices that would control elections vowing to contest the elections they're running in as part of a plan to reinstate Donald Trump. And interestingly, all of this is happening in a region whose water and thus food supply is literally drying up. In 2017, it was too late. In 2022, it's even later than you think. But while Neo Reaction of Basilisk is an extremely bleak book, it is not a defeatist one. And since we're coming up on Halloween, I thought I'd turn back to those horror philosophy bits. Uh, so yes, fascism is an existential threat. I mean, we're at a moment in history where the only thing that feels like it would give hum most of humanity decent survival odds is extremely competent and compassionate political leadership, and instead what we have is a bunch of people whose malfeasance is only checked by their stupidity. This is an existential threat, which is why I opted to deal with it in terms of horror. But interestingly, the lens works both ways. I spend much of Neo Reaction of Basilisk spinning a horror story about how we're all going to die. But at the end of the day, the point of meticulously understanding the horror of a bunch of tech bro fuckheads and of how a bunch of people who blatantly should be broadly inept con artists are instead in a position to destroy the world is that if you figure out the way that their horror works, you can also figure out how to be a figure of creeping horror to them. There's a theory put out there by Marxist sci-fi writer and reputed sex pest China Mievel that there are two modes of horror that exist in a strange and uneasy relationship with each other the hauntological and the weird. The hauntological is your kind of classic gothic horror, buried things returning and, well, haunting. Whereas the weird is just the alien other. Think ghost stories versus Cthulhu. <laughs> so for the most part, these fascists are operating in a model of the weird. They're a kind of cosmic horror force of nature battering the world as the eschaton draws near, an implacable and deadly other that doesn't even hate you personally, it just wants you dead. In which case, the obvious way to serve as horror to them is to be hauntological and gothic. Now, obviously, I'm not going to tell anyone not to just crank up a Cure album and wear a lot of black, but we want to be careful about exactly what flavor of gothic to be. Uh, there's an anecdote that Douglas Rushkoff uh, first came out with a little bit after Neo Reaction of Basilisk was published, and he spun it into a book that came out last month. Uh, and I think it's apropos here. As Rushkoff tells it, a group of five tech investment billionaires flew him out to the middle of nowhere to do a private Q&A in which their biggest question, once they got down to it, was figuring out how, after society collapsed and they were all holed up in their network of underground tunnels, they should maintain control over their security people and not just have them execute a coup and take over the bunker. Now, the tech bros are suggesting stuff to Rushkoff like, what if we put on control collars that would shock the guards if they didn't obey? Or maybe we could just use robots, or we could put locks on the food, uh, you know, bi biometric locks. And Rushkoff sort of meekly suggests that maybe they should just treat their workers nicely and ensure loyalty. And the tech bros just look at him like he's crazy. I think about this story a lot. Rushkoff's conclusion in his book, which I don't disagree with per se, is that the virtues of cooperation and community are the only way to fight back. 
And I certainly put a lot of my political energy into that basket and into helping making sure Ithaca is a place that stays nice even as things go very badly around it. But I think that there's a more important conclusion to draw from Roshkoff's story, which is that these guys are as completely fucked as the rest of us and are 100% going to get eaten by their own security staff. To make an obvious point about stupidity, while it is very hard to defeat, it is also extremely unlikely to actually win. It's much more of a situation where everyone loses, or at least where a lot of people do. So here is my extremely grim hope project in a nutshell. I think it is overwhelmingly likely that we are entering some very brutal and very lethal times. I think that there aren't going to be a lot of historians in the 22nd century who look at the 2020s and the 2030s and go, that'd be a good time to live. Uh, and that's still before the worst of climate change even comes through. But I suspect that we are not actually looking at human extinction, or at least at the point of human, uh, or at least at the point of human extinction, you have officially crossed to a level of pessimism that stops being very interesting. Uh, I want to do another excerpt. This is not actually from the book. This is from an essay I wrote for a journal called Art Against Art shortly after the book uh, was published, where basically they asked me to take the 50,000 word essay and do it in 2,000 words. This idea of inevitability is, of course, a close match for the dilemma pro, uh, posed by the alt-right's retooled detournment. Land's argument is that you're never going to get rid of racist idiots, which means that attempts at diversity are always going to be doomed to violent failure. This means that attempts at, uh, no, the strategy of the near-reactionary meme, on the other hand, is that any idea, attempt to render racist viewpoints as taboo and socially unacceptable is only going to make them easier to spread. It's the same basic strategy in both cases, one that Nick Land helped coin back in his CCRU days when he called it hyperstition, combining the notion of hype with superstition. A hyperstition is a fiction that brings itself about as reality through its existence as an idea. For, existence, for example, the Trump presidency. It's a clear match for what the alt-right memes are doing, but it also describes Land's larger supervillain tactics, uh, describing the irrepressible nature uh, of reactionaries in part to make them so and bring about his vision of a more tentacled future. Two can play at this game. But figuring out what our hyperstitious alternative should be is tricky. It's not as though the litany of failed and abandoned leftist utopian visions is in dire need of new additions. Um, and more to the point, that's exactly what the alt-right's mimetic tactics are designed to be most effective against. We're going to need something stranger and more rooted in reactionary tactics the same way their memes are rooted in situationist ones. One strand worth pulling on a bit more is the basic notion of ostentatious villainy. In Nick Land's case, this is firmly rooted in notions of horror. He said that he considers his major works these days to be the philosophical horror stories, he writes. And more to the point, he's interested in the general aesthetic and approach of weird fiction. Think H.P. Lovecraft and his many literary descendants. Tentacle monsters and unknowably alien horrors abound in Land's work. A Twitter handle called Outsideness, a blog at xenosystems.net, etc. But Marxist horror maestro China Mievel argues that the weird exists in a fundamental dualism with the hauntological, a more classically gothic mode of horror rooted not in the unfathomable other, but in the re repressed past to returning to demand reckoning. And there's an obvious and appealing perversity here, which is that the hauntological and the reactionary have a natural affinity. Indeed, on the surface, it's surprising that the alt-right would gravitate toward tentacles when the hauntological so clearly suits their irrepressible or reactionary tendency undermining the liberal consensus narrative. The problem is simply that hauntological approaches don't work anywhere near as well as they'd like. One need only read Mencius Moldbug's turgidly facile attempts at revisionist history to see that dealing with the material messiness of the past is not an alt-right specialty. Indeed, the truth, obvious as it is to point out, is that the entire narrative of traditionalism is a clumsy construct of the present day with an at best minimal relationship with the actual past. In reality, history is teeming with suppressed and untold narratives ripe for unearthing. The most obvious vector of, of attack uh, is, of course, the narratives that the alt-right is most visibly paranoid about, the, exp uh, the expression of, the stories of women, people of color, sexual minorities, people with disabilities, and many others whose erasure is, in practice, how the white supremacist history of Western civilization gets made into the traditional one. 
Equally important, if not more so, are stories from outside the scope of Western civilization, particularly those of uh, indigenous populations whose cultures have, in effect, been overwritten by European imperialism. But these are specific examples of a more general approach. Just as Nick Land presents the revolutionary tendency as essentially ir uh, irrepressible, leftist approaches must envision themselves as fundamentally impossible to kill. In other words, the point is not just to tell sto the stories that are erased from the neo-reactionary narrative, but to make it so that those stories cannot be erased in the first place and instead insist on their presence and relevance. More broadly, yes, it's hard not to feel like Land has a point. In the face of climate change, increasing concentration of wealth, a startling bevy of existential threats, and, oh yes, let's not forget President Trump, the nagging suspicion that we might be due for a grimly neo-reactionary turn is hard to dis uh, dismiss out of hand. And in the face of that, there is an obvious desire to figure out how to save the left from collapse into the absolute and total unity of Landian techno-death. In which case, art, with its ability to craft hyperstitions, is an obvious choice. But instead of attempting to dictate the terms of the future as the alt-right does, our goal is at once more modest and more dangerous. To insist that the future remains unsettled and be forced to continue grappling with the unfinished business of the past. Our business is not to write the future, but to haunt it. And that's at least what I want to recommend. Haunting the future. I think the obligation of those unimpressed with the fascist eschaton is simply to describe other ways of living and to do so in ways that are durable. Speaking from within the queer community, which is one of the ones the fascists are most openly eliminationist about at this point, I think that's especially important. In realistic terms, it feels unlikely that a decade from now it's going to be easier to be trans in really most of the world. So this becomes a real, if you could go back to the Weimar Republic in 1920 and give the queer community advice on the next decade, what would you say? Which obviously the main advice is run for your life or shoot that Hitler guy in the face, but let's assume that you're talking to people who can't afford to emigrate or to create massive temporal paradoxes that destabilize the fabric of reality. Or if we want to take things back to the modern setting, what do you say when there's nowhere for queer people to run because fascism is as globalized as everything else? What I would say, roughly, is to get to work writing the books that they're going to be burning. Get to work documenting every silly detail of this fragile cultural moment where anarchist occultist queer bloggers are being invited to fucking NYU to give talks. Where there are suddenly more ways of being queer and more specifically named flavors of queerness than anyone can possibly catalog and understand. Make a record so that after the idiot fascists kill us by the millions and then get eaten by their own security guards, that record is there. And the next time that queer culture rises from the grave like the irrepressible gothic horror that it is, we at least don't have to start from scratch. And I don't think the answer for any other threatened group changes very much. I want to read one more very short excerpt. And this one isn't even from me, uh, not by me. It's rather from the British writer Alan Moore from very late in his novel Jerusalem which came out in 2016, the year after Neo Reaction of Basilisk went out to its Kickstarter backers. Uh, this novel writes at glorious length about his rapidly dying working class neighborhood in the city of Northampton, uh, the Burroughs. And this is a bit is a quick monologue Moore gives to his authorial stand-in character, who within the novel completes a series of paintings that are a clear analog for the novel itself with the supposed task of saving her, her uh, neighborhood. And even if they did rebuild it, down to the last doorstep. That would just be horrible. That would just do for buildings what invasion of the body snatchers did for people. It would be some sort of deprivation theme park. Unless you restore it how it was, with all its life and atmospheres intact, it's not worth bothering. I've saved the boroughs, Worry, but not how you save the whale or save the National Health Service. I've saved it the way you save ships in bottles. It's the only plan that works. Sooner or later, all the people and places that we loved are finished, and the only way to keep them safe is art. That's what art is for. It rescues everything from time. So what did Neo Reaction of Basilisk rescue from time? Well, one of the last essays I completed for it was called My Vagina is Haunted, Notes on Turfs, which looked at the still nominally leftist phenomenon of trans-exclusive ra radical feminists, mostly focusing on the history of anti-trans feminism, going back to like Gloria Steinem, Janice Raymond, Mary Daly, all those second wave classics. 
And literally, as I was finishing off this essay, I realized, oh shit, I, sh I want to be a girl. Uh, the timing was such that I had to get the book out before I was ready to publicly come out. So I literally actually had to run a first edition under my dead name, and I dedicated uh, My Vagina is Hauntage to Elizabeth, and then put a second edition uh, out a few months later after I came out. And there's a funny bit that I could do here about transition as an intellectual basilisk, and it probably deserves more than a throwaway gag at the end of an hour-long talk. But Rereading Nia Reaction of Basilisk to, to write this, what I really saw most clearly was someone running very hard into the absolute limits of her ability to continue existing as the person that she was. This is a book that goes deep on a specific flavor of white toxic masculinity, one that frankly, there but for the gra grace of God, went I. The book proved in many ways to be an exorcism of that, and rereading it, I can feel myself straining at the limits of a male identity that was beginning to crack in earnest. And my point here isn't to triumphantly reveal queerness as a secret utopia at the heart of the book. I don't want to reveal any sort of secret utopianism at all. The time for ideas about how the future might be better is past. The future is going to be a lot worse than what it already is, and it's already very bad. What we need are ideas for living differently right now, in these dying moments of what has proven a fatally flawed attempt at global civilization. And while I'd certainly encourage being a girl if it's something you've ever vaguely considered, I'm not going to pretend that transitioning is necessary or indeed sufficient. This is the sort of work that encompasses every aspect of your life. We need to become people that the fascists are afraid of, and more to the point, we need to scare them in ways that killing us won't solve. I want to start with the important parts of that. The people who are doing the wor work of building durable communities from the ground up and imbuing those communities with strong values of mutual aid right now are doing tremendous amounts of work of, in deciding where geographically the people who survive this are going to come from. There are people who are on the streets who are standing up to fascists, who are documenting who and what they are, who are doing the fundamental work to keep communities safe and give them a chance of fighting back against this tidal wave of fatal stupidity. stupidity. I hope that I've been entertaining you for the past hour, but I promise you, what is happening in this room tonight doesn't have half as much bearing on the end of the world as what is happening in the nearest food pantry. But we're here at a book talk, so let's end here with us today. From an academia expat to the people at NYU and the Institute of Public Research that very kindly brought her here tonight, a sentimental outro fit for a 9,000 word essay being polished off the night before it's due. While the arts and humanities are neither the whole nor even the most important part of the battle, we are still a crucial part. There are very few generalizations about the entirety of human history that you can make, but one of them is that there is nothing that makes art go away. There has literally never been a pogrom or a disaster or anything so bad that people stopped telling stories or singing songs, and short of human extinction, I don't think there's going to be. So, we're going to have our part to play. The forces aligned against us are weird and scary, and I think art is really the only vector through which we have an opportunity to make ourselves weirder and scarier. When the existing ideas all say that we're fucked, the only thing left to do is to make new ideas. Thank you. Thank you. You want to grab a mic and we'll do dueling banjo style? All right. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah, but also, um, I welcome questions from anyone specifically here. Um, so, I'm just going to start with one question. Oh, great. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elle. That was amazing. Thank you. I had a good time. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> So I saw a tweet today, I hope it wasn't yours or somebody else's in this room, but there was a piece about Yarvin in Vox, uh, that was which I haven't, I haven't read yet. I, um, I have neither, I've yeah. been at MoMA all day. Oh yeah, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but whoever tweeted it said basically, um, uh, uh, why do these people, why are these people so convinced that when it comes down to it, they're gonna be wearing the boot and not be crushed underneath the boot, basically. And I was thinking like, First of all, just about him in particular, that like he's already got the boot in his mouth so much. Like yeah. that seems to be his thing. I like, mean, some people just really like the taste of leather, and there's yeah. nothing wrong with that. There are just more healthy ways of following it than becoming a fascist. Well, and I mean, I think it was your interview with Nathan Robinson that really finally convinced me about this. But like, I just feel like with him, it's very much like he's like 
bad things are happening. What if I were the guy who they turn to in this way? But then, like, he has to basically sell out every single sentence. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, I, I, and so just, like, in that context, and then thinking about what you were saying about sort of deplatforming through sarcasm and anger, basically, like, this, this, this technique that you were saying, I was wondering how that comes together with, and maybe I overread this early in the talk, but, like, when you introduced his version of the red pill, you said, like, sign me up. Yeah. And there's this thing that goes with the stupidity, which is, like, sign me up. Like, like everything is fucked, and sign me up for yeah, something, I mean, and do you see what I'm saying? And there's, right. like, what, the question is, what has the, why do they have the hook of that, like, id for sign me up, fuck it kind of energy? Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I think yeah. this is... I think a related concept, at least. I don't know if this is an answer to your question, but it's what sort of springs to mind. Uh, an observation that um, my friend Jack Grimm, who co-authored one of the books, uh, one of the essays in New Ration of Basilisk with me, uh, has made, which is that the fash are absolutely obsessed with present presenting themselves as edgy rebels. They really, really desperately want to be kind of the cool, rebellious person. Um, and they're not, obviously. There is nothing whatsoever rebellious about let's lick the billionaire's boot. But they put so much effort into the, re into the rebellious branding that it would be impossible not for it to have some, some allure. When you spend that much time trying to be an edgy, rebellious punk, you're going to attract at least some edginess. And it's also worth noting that, you know, historically a lot of edgy punk scenes and related sort of avant-garde scenes have had historical fascism. Um, you know, they, this has always been a thing that happens. So I think that's the closest thing I can have to an answer is that they just really fetishize uh, their rebellious persona, whether or not that's remotely real. Other questions? <laughs> oh, goody. <laughs> In your work, you, co you frequently go on tangents about various subjects that aren't necessarily related to the main subject of the book. Range in your reaction, uh, Basilisk alone, you go into the works, uh, you go into Brian Fuller's Hamble, the works of William Blake, and other such things. Outside of your work, you go into, who, uh, <coughs> in Last War in Albion, just to use another example, you had an entire chapter section devoted solely to Transaraka. <laughs> Please, early internet trans erotica. You have to make it sound as bad as it is. <laughs> yeah, early, early tr internet trans erotica. As such, I would like to push this on to a tangent of its own that has absolutely nothing to do with anything you've talked about. Fantastic. Which Kate Bush songs give people the best orgasms? Sean, my daughter is right there. <laughs> uh, I, I need to out Sean as a longtime friend and reader of the blog who came here tonight to uh, specifically ask a horrible question like this. Uh, running up that hill, but only when it's covered by placebo. Next question. <laughs> what did he answer? You can't ask Brits questions like that. They don't know what to do. <laughs> All right. Um, I can turn to one of the questions asked online. Um, from Max Thornton, thanks for a great talk and a wonderful book. Do you see long-termism and or effective altruism as relating at all to the things you wrote about in your reaction to Basilisk, and if so, how? I mean, long-termism, I want to say, that's broad enough that it could go any number of ways. Um, broadly, I think long-termism is probably hopelessly optimistic. That's roughly what I'd say about long-termism. Uh, effective altruism is specifically a... Uh, spin-off movement of Yudkowsky and his weird cult, uh, and I think is uh, irrevocably tainted by that association. I don't know the group well enough to answer in any detail. No, I mean, it's probably a great question. I just... <laughs> I, I'm sympathetic to what long-termism wants to do. I just don't think it's the... It's not where I'm putting my bets, at least. Less humorous question. Uh, in the 
in your you talked about how the solution how the way forward is to make art that will it'll survive and as mentioned in the introduction you are currently working on a comic book with your husband Penn who is right there yes yep. Brandon prophecy how has this affected your how has this mindset affected your approach to working on this comic <sighs> which mindset the need to make art that will that will haunt the future yeah um I mean, this comic, all right, so Britain of Prophecy is uh, specifically kind of uh, my husband and I riffing on, like, the classic 90s Vertigo comic. Think, like, Alan Moore, think Neil Gaiman's Sandman, stuff like that. So it's very much um, already haunted. It, 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 it's very much a work that is already looking at the past and reckoning with, uh, reckoning with the past. Uh, but it's also very much a work about... Uh, the notion of big picture stories. Uh, there's a phrase that we've worked in several times already and it's only gonna keep coming up of the story of Britain. Um, and it's very much a book that's asking questions like what the fuck does it mean to say something like the story of Britain? What is the story of America? Uh, what is a national story? Um, and we have some pretty cynical answers about that. You know, we're, uh, on the whole I'm pretty unimpressed with the story of Britain as a concept. Um, but where the book is going, without giving too many spoilers for a book that only has four issues out and is planned for 30, uh, is that we are going to be suggesting a very different way of talking about the story of Britain and what um, a story like that talks about and who it focuses on. Certainly a very different one than, say, Neil Gaiman offered about stories in Sandman. Uh, and I think that's our haunt of the future is this question of like what 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 is uh, uh, what is what can what can the story of Britain mean? That that's our bid for haunting the future with that. Uh, okay, I have more questions. Questions are are just pouring in. Um, so uh, the next one is from Ian Gill. Did your success with the three subject structure of New Reaction of Basilisk, Yudkowsky, Arvin Land contribute to your use of it for your later work, The Future That Was, The Future Is Born, A Triptic Moment, and Retro Shock Cyberpunk Within the Cyberpunk Dystopia? And if so, what makes that structure so useful and insightful? Occult numerological answers are acceptable. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, so the essay you're talking, uh, this uh, guy is talking, Ian? Ian. <laughs> All right, Ian. So the essay you're talking about was one for uh, the magazine Strange Matters. And they came to me with the structure of the triple. They had this thing called the Triple Review. Uh, they, were an op they were a uh, workers' co-op uh, intellectual magazine. They pitched me on writing for them. Uh, and they came to me with this thing called the Triple Review, which is just a review of three things, any three things. Um, and, you know, move around and make connections among them. And they came to me saying, you know, and notably, New York Action of Basilisk is really just a long triple review. And I'm like, yes, very cute, very good. You've successfully seduced me. I will write one of these for you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a structure I like. Um, I think three... I'm not going to even occult answer, sadly. I'm going to suggest that what's nice about three things is that you have now defined a space you can move within. Anytime you're stuck, you know, you can take two and play the third one against it. With three, you just finally start to have enough interesting combinations to really work and build up a head of steam and a riff. It's just a structural, you know, a nice structural thing. Uh, it's enough ideas to get meaty. I mean, it also helps that um, in the case of New Reaction of Basilisk, like two of them are, I mean, two, if not all three of them are like closely related to each other, right? Like right. the clans, yeah. Like well, I mean, it's no. I think you can take any of the two in Near Ration of Basilisk and say these two are X, but the third one is Y, okay. um, and you know, and and that's a nice thing to keep moving your moving your essay forward. You know, you're talking about uh, one thing, you're bogging down. You need to make a transition. There's, and you can go in contrast one of these other things. It's such a nice engine. It really keeps an essay moving. Uh, okay, uh, another question. Uh, we have one from the audience. Ooh, oh, excellent. Um, so, hi. Uh, my question is that um, you got your start writing about uh, works of fiction, Doctor Who, British comics, things like that. Um, and it feels like, it's been a while since I read the book, but based on my recollections and you're talking about it, the figures you talk about in the main essay are also people who have some association, if not with fiction, with sort of broader, I guess, sort of sci-fi-esque ideas. Uh, I would ask, uh, 
How did your experience writing about fiction inform how you wrote about these people and what, I guess, sort of lessons you took from that to talking about like people with, hit, with relations to actual politics? I hate to be the person who denies the premise of a question, okay. but sure. uh, for me, it's really two modes of, of stuff I did in my academic days. You know, I was in a PhD program in English. I was doing film and media studies. I was very familiar already with moving between we're talking about a work of art and we're talking about some philosophical theory. These are both just modes that are very familiar to me. So it's kind of just pulling two different strands of stuff I already do. And, you know, as Sean points out, in Near Reaction of Basilisk, I'm swerving through Milton and uh, yeah. Hannibal Lecter freely. And in Doctor Who, I'm just as prone to go. And now let's talk about uh, 60s occultist philosophers. You know, I, I've always been one who veers back and forth. And even now, as I'm making this uh, you know, mid, mid to late career pivot toward fiction, I'm writing extremely intellectual, wanky fiction. Sure. Like, I am what I am. <laughs> Okay, this question is from uh, uh, Christopher Brown. Um, oh, hi, Chris. Sorry you couldn't make it today. <laughs> uh, apart from the unprecedented diversity in the cast and production crew, what is an aspect um, uh, the Chris Chibnall era, era of Doctor Who does better than any <laughs> Sorry, give me that again. I was too busy laughing. <laughs> okay. Uh, apart from the unprecedented diversity in the cast and production crew, what is an aspect of the Chris Chibnall era of Doctor Who, uh, of Doctor Who does better than any previous era? Nothing. Literally nothing. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that's all I've got. Uh, that, Doctor Who has not been a pleasant experience for several years now. <laughs> it's over now. That, it does that very nicely. Most of the others do it too, but I like it does being over better than any of them. <laughs> uh, okay, sorry. I'm like scanning the audience to see if... Okay, leave. I like this question about sort of your approach and the fiction, but I want to flip it around and just mm -hmm. and ask about, is it really important to them? Because I'm thinking of like, mm -hmm. if you go back to like cypherpunks, right? Mm -hmm. Like anybody on the extreme, like whatever, you mentioned Austrian economics, right? Hoppe yeah. was here at NYU. Like, like mm -hmm. this is like, you know, or um, no, um, sorry, uh, what's his face? But the point is like the that group of like extreme right, whatever cipher, and that, that gave birth to the cypherpunks, they all really cared a lot about fiction, or I don't know if you can put it that way, but they recommended fiction among their like most fundamental documents, like Tim May, Neil Stevenson, yeah. was, was like crucial to him, you know, like, mm -hmm. like that type of thing. And that seems to me like the Rushkoff story is about that too. It's like they have no imagination, the tech lords. Yeah. And that's what this other group is filling in. Like they're giving them a little bit of sci-fi because they're, and they're speaking the language that they already know, but they have no way of, do you see what I mean? Like there's yeah. a limit to their imagination, but fundamentally the imagination is fictional. It's just like really, like you said, like kind of stupid fiction or like empty or something like that. Yeah. Um, what was the question? there? <laughs> well, just because the previous, just because the previous question was like, you know, are you coming at it from a fundamentally fictional place? This question is like, do you see Neo Reaction and these other fash things as being fundamentally fictional in a way? Or like, what's the status of their, how deep is their commitment to the aspect of them that you have more than anyone surfaced as being sort of sci-fi, you know? Yeah, I mean, in some cases a lot. I mean, we are talking about something that's coming out of the Silicon Valley tech culture, and they really do like their sci-fi there. Like, I, 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 I do not want to in any way suggest that their love of Frank Herbert, of Neil Stevenson, is anything less than sincere. I think they really actually love these works. Um, I think they have a very limited perspective on fiction. Um, I think that, you know, it's, there's a very specific type of fiction they like. Um, I quoted Alan Moore late in my, late in my talk, and he's been uh, touring for his short story collection lately and giving his usual line about how the popularity of superhero movies is probably linked to fascism somehow. Um, and I don't know that I think he's wrong. You know, I think that it is probably not a coincidence that this rise of fascism has also come at a point where the, the movies that are popular are 50% Marvel by volume. 
we are having a real impoverishment of our artistic uh, of our artistic public sphere over the last decade or two. Uh, we are having more and more franchise movies and fewer and fewer oddballs that uh, that break out big. And remakes. Yeah, and remakes. So many remakes. I mean, yeah, franchise movies, sequels, remakes, uh, often decades old franchi franchises. Um, there's a real willingness to be culturally stuck right now uh, that is not dissimilar to what, what I think you're describing in the fascist love of five sci-fi writers. You haven't played yet, so I'm gonna pick, I, I'm gonna pick you if I'm picking my questions. <laughs> So uh, I had the misfortune of recently uh, being assigned to read Peter Thiel's book, like the whole thing. Uh, I survived. Uh, uh, and I think like talking about what kind of art fascists enjoy and like the modern like MCU complex and reboots. Uh, do you think there's any correlation between Peter Thiel like hating Star Trek and loving Star Wars and the current state of the reboots of those two franchises, one of which is incredibly like diverse and niche and weird. And the other one is like, Let's do the MCU, but in Star Wars. Probably less of a relation than the fact that the people who own the MCU own Star Wars. Talk about William Blake. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you want me to say? I, he, uh, that's, that's too broad. Come on. <laughs> in the book you talk about... Towards the end of the book, you met, bring up that how William Blake would assess the three main characters of your book. Yeah, I don't think you'd be impressed. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay, and I take it. Okay, that, that's. Uh, uh, is there anyone he would be impressed other than Alan Moore? I like to think he'd like me. <laughs> <laughs> um, who would Blake like uh, alive and working right now? Um, hang on. Yeah, he'd probably find Grimes pretty funny. I think he'd be a Grimes fan. <laughs> That's what I'm going with. William Blake, closet Grimes fan. <laughs> Just from an aesthetic perspective. Yeah, no, like... It makes sense. I, I, yeah, like, she has a certain... It's the... Uh, her song, Kill V. Mame, which she explains is about uh, Al Pacino's character in The Godfather, but he's an immortal space vampire. And I look at that and I'm like, yes you get William Blake's personal mythology. You and William Blake are fundamentally on a page that very few people are on. <laughs> uh, okay, one more uh, a hybrid audience question. Uh, from Matthew Call, is the purported disappearance of Nick Land the latest part of his weird post-breakdown fascist monstrosity? You know, I have not been following the Nick Land gossip. Has he disappeared? Yeah, I, this is news to me, too. Uh, I don't know. Maybe Matthew he's just Cole back clarified. on that. It's hard to tell. I don't want to ascribe clever motivation to Nick Land at the end of the day uh, because I think he's actually just a burnt-out, druggy idiot. Uh, but I don't miss him if he's disappeared. Let's just go with that. I want to uh, deploy moderator privilege and ask my own question, you, which is... You get to do yeah, that. Um, which is, so what is the degree of influence that you think these people actually have on politics as it's being conducted today? Yeah, I mean, I don't think any... Uh, it's not zero, you know? Steve Bannon, Bannon is a known Mencius Mullenbach fan. That is, at this point, well-documented. Uh, Steve Bannon... But he was cast out. He's not... He's still not uninfluential. Like, he's still out there and, well, apparently for a couple months he won't be very influential. But that's fun. Um, no, I, Moldbug has some real influence. Moldbug makes it onto Tucker, Tucker Carlson. I said J.D. Vance and Blake Masters uh, are known Moldbug fans. So the answer isn't zero. But I don't really want to suggest that any of them are leading rather than following. I think what we have is something that very much has its own momentum and its own horrible gravity that you can, that is kind of fractal in its shittiness. Uh, and because of that, you can pick an arbitrary part like these weird tech bro losers and zoom in on them and get, and get conclusions that will tell you about the whole. But I don't want to suggest that like 
you know, Mencius, Mulbugger, Nick Land are the secret heart of everything that's going on, and that, like, they're the pop. No, no, they're just, like, if you zoom in on this part of the canvas enough, the image starts to recur in useful ways. More questions from uh, Meet Space or virtual audience? Ask me questions, Meet Space. <laughs> No. <laughs> yes, we have a question. Uh, that's fair. That's fair. Um, I. Are there, are there anything else yeah, online? If there's, I, I don't know. I'm not seeing any um, any more questions on this email thread. In which case, um, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Two more. Yay. A lot of these. A lot of these figures are American figures. Do you think, how much of this do you think is coming out of American culture specifically and I mean, more internationally? Obviously, I'm, you know, I'm American. I study UK culture pretty heavily, as some of my other works uh, probably suggested. That's where I'm looking. Um, and, you know, Nick Land is British, but, okay, British. We're not really that far from American, uh, culturally speaking. But I bet if you looked at, you know, your Russian uh, fascists, if you looked at... Yes. You know, yeah. It, um, if you looked deep at uh, Modi and some of his supporters in India, you would find a lot of the same broad patterns. You know, you'd probably... You'd probably want to take a few steps back, start uh, start earlier. I bet there are going to be some unique characteristics as you cross cultural and language barriers. But I bet the basic phenomenon of cratering death stupidity is still there. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually, I just wrote an article about uh, Nick Land, Mencius Moldbug, and yeah. a Russian postmodernist writer that I think, like, weirdly has these affinities. Right. Uh, and they're more than just aesthetic affinities. They're, yeah. It's more just than, a, like, a love of, I don't know, like, body horror and cyberpunk blah, 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 you know? Right. I mean, and in practical terms, you know, if you are going to try to follow this in a materialist way, I would be stunned if their funding networks don't overlap, you know? These people are getting money from a lot of the same places, if nothing else. Given the, let's be charitable, public perception shift in, with regards to J.K. Rowling, would a version of Neo Reaction of Basilisk engage more with the Harry Potter fanfic that Eliezer Yudkowsky wrote to, dis, to pitch rationalism? If I were, like, did a revised version? Yes. No publisher has enough money to make me read that. You would need, like, Obama memoir size advances to get me to read that thing. <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't think so. I don't think that's a particularly fruitful angle. Um, mostly, you know, whether to engage or deplatform slash ignore is really a kind of case-by-case -case decision. But I think with the case of J.K. Rowling, when you have someone who has this uh, multimedia juggernaut that is directly funding her genocidal politics, the answer is don't engage. You do not give Harry Potter any more attention than you need to. Uh, more questions have rolled in in the meantime. Um, so uh, uh, to the question, I guess, of uh, the transnational nature of some of these phenomena, Nicholas, Nicholas Garcia asks, does any city represent new reactionary principles in action more than Singapore? If so, what does its comparison with cities like New York say about the instantiation of these ideals in practice? Yeah, Singapore. I don't know a ton about Singapore. Um, most of what I know about Singapore is from William Gibson's old uh, old essay, which has some uh, real like Orientalist yellow peril problems that will become apparent in the title, Singapore colon Disneyland with the death penalty. Um, but... I don't know, I wouldn't be surprised if Dubai is right up there. There is this sort of uh, billionaire city-state controlled entirely by finance vibe that a couple of cities have. Um, I know, you know, I, I have an Apple TV at home, and occasionally it'll do these, like, long Vista pans. It's screensavers are just like, we flew a drone so around. So creepy. Yet oddly pretty often. 
Um, but it's interesting watching the cityscape ones because anytime it goes to Dubai, and I think it has one or two for Singapore, there's this horrible soullessness to it that even like Hong Kong, a city that is just as steeped in like intense finance, at least has this sort of chaotic mess nature to it. It looks like just way too much money was vomited onto the skyline at once, and there's this sort of chaotic realness to it. Whereas you look at Dubai and it looks like, and it looks like you typed uh, rich city into one of those AI, AI art generators and it just spat out Dubai. Uh, so yeah, those sort of hyper-designed cities, uh, I think there is something there, yeah. Uh, from, uh, wait, Victor, do you have a, are you raising your hand? Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. I, I'm annoying our poor tech guy by pacing, I expect. <laughs> um, from Stephanie Van Dyke, how do you imagine Haunt the Future ties into movements like Discordians or the occult generally? Uh, directly. Like, I'm, I'm clearly getting that from my, uh, from my long love of those things. I mean, Discordianism was never my big one, but, like, I have a deep love for Discordianism. Um, it's just fun. It's just cool. And, yeah, Haunt the Future, now that you say it, obviously there's a bit of, like, Discordian uh, aesthetic influence on that. Well, well spotted. Uh, from Matthew Culligan, how optimistic can we really be about haunting? I'm thinking about the destruction of Hirschfeld's clinic and the cultural destruction of trans culture. It's perhaps overstating it to say that we had to start entirely again, but it really did nearly destroy the possibility of haunting from queer Berlin. I mean, I want to suggest that there's already a kind of natural cap on the optimism involved in haunting since you're dead. <laughs> Uh, I don't think I'm being very optimistic when my utopian plan involves being murdered <laughs> by fascists. Uh, no, it's going to be terrible. We are going to lose a lot. Um, I do think that there are some possibilities. You know, the Hirschfeld archive was vulnerable for being a single, because it was a single point of failure. Uh, I think that we have a very different sort of vulnerability in the, in the intense ephemerality of uh, digital spaces, but it's at least a very different problem. You cannot uh, destroy it all with one well-placed fire anymore. Um, so it's a different kind of frailty. It's a different kind of fragility. Uh, but no, I, mean, I, I do not want to present haunting as unduly optimistic. Uh, okay, another question from Christopher Brown. Uh, to expand on the question of political influence, how does one decide which figures slash groups to prioritize spotlighting? Uh, weed? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I must, I must obey the inscrutable uh, exaltations of my soul. I just sort of follow where my ADHD takes me, if I'm being honest. You know, I don't think that there's a general case answer here. I don't think that there's... I can't tell, you know tell someone else what the correct book for them to write is. These were the right ones for me to write as evidenced by the fact that I stayed up late and night after night writing it. Um, and at the end of the day, that's really how I picked it. You know, I picked it over. I've joked that writing a book is best understood as, the, uh, as failing at the much easier task of not writing a book. Um, and, you know, this is just the book I, this is just the book I failed not to write. How successful is the Locked Tomb series at haunting the future? I don't know. Let's wait for book four to come out. Um, no, I, this is a question about Tamsin Muir's Hugo-nominated sci-fi series, The Locked Tomb, which is very good and very queer and very funny, and I recommend it. Um, but uh, how successful is it at haunting the future? I don't know. We don't. It's hard to tell. Uh, my optimism right, rises with Nona, uh, with the most recent book, which does kind of engage in the present a bit more. But with a book that is, so, with a series that is as fond of its big ostentatious reveals, context shifting reveals as that, I don't want to make any comments on that without the last book in place. I suppose the real question is, how can one determine something is going to haunt the future from the present from the perspective of the present. You can, you do the best you can. Like you, you make your bets and we find out, uh, and we find out in a couple decades. Um, I have my bets, maybe I'm, maybe I'm very wrong, but my bet is local community and weird art. Uh, it's a self-serving bet, you know, much like why these figures, it, it's kind of 
chosen because it's where my brain wants to go. Uh, I'm glad there are people making other bets. I don't want to be a Hirschfield Archive-like single point of failure in the fate of humanity. Uh, that would be alarming. Uh, but this is kind of where I am and where my brain goes. Um, you know, it's, it's where my instincts are. They are self-serving to an extent. They are picked in part because it's what I'm interested in. Um, but I do try to think about it and try to, you know, try to be as strategic as I can within my own biases. But I think much like subjects of books, that's one where I'm glad we have, you know, billions of individual subjectivities assigned to the task. Um, okay, so maybe, wait, am I, am I missing someone raising their hand? No. Um, so maybe one more, one more question from the, from the Zoom. Sure. Um, if you if you have the energy, I have the energy <laughs> for this. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, uh, once again from Ian Gill, why is the art associated with the rise of early twenty first century fascism so shitty compared to the early twentieth century fascism? <sighs> because that's a good question, man. I, I want to like pat off the cuff answer, and I don't have one. Um. Part of that is probably selection bias. You know, I bet the Harry Potter and the methods of rationality of the uh, 1920s has probably been mercifully lost to uh, memory. I bet there was, in fact, a lot of shitty fascist art, uh, you know, coming out of the Weimar Republic. Um, probably some bits, you know, I mean. Also Nick socialist realism. Yeah. Famously not good. Yeah. Mostly. Um, you know, I mean, I think there probably are some interesting right-wing pieces being made in the world. Um, I do actually think Nick Land's horror stories, at least one of them is kind of interesting. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not averse to the notion, I mean, if you want to go to a wider, uh, fashy art, you know, I certainly have some aesthetic and intellectual time for black metal, even if I'm not going to be uh, wild about the fact that they're all fucking Nazis. Um, you know, there is, there probably is interesting fascist art being made out there. I don't think that uh, politics are a great selector for interesting art. I think that probably there's more interesting leftist art than there is right-wing art. I think there are some good reasons for that, but being leftist isn't an automatic guarantee of good art and Honestly, being fascist isn't an automatic guarantee of being shitty. But also, like, uh, postmodernism is part has to be part of the answer, right? Yeah. Like, we're recite everything is being recycled. Like the way that you know, for example, Chan culture works is all about like rapid fire recycling, like rehashing. Postmodernism is certainly a really good example of why you shouldn't ever be confident that your artistic movement is politics proof. Because, um, man, postmodernism looked like it was going to be great for leftism in, you know, 1970 or so. And, whoo, that didn't work out. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, I think that being interesting is somewhat divorced from politics. I mean, I think that uh, Nick Land and Mencius Moldbug uh, really prove that being interesting is divorced from being right, good, or politically sound. Uh, all of these are very separate concepts. Um, okay. We got one more oh, in the oh, audience. Great. It's not a question, it's a comment, so it doesn't count. But uh, All right. Grimes, well, it would be uh, a shame to give an academic talk where someone doesn't do of course, more of tradition, a comment. Really. Uh, Grimes is absolutely like uh, doing fascist art that is incredible from an artistic perspective. Oh man, but, Grimes uh, is yeah, Grimes is like soft fascist flirting. Uh, I wish it made me like her less, uh, but it doesn't. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so yes, Grimes is an excellent example of interesting fascist art. All right, we're going to close with Sean again. <laughs> Our comment, Ritesh Babu says hi. Hi, Ritesh. Hi. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, so thank you all so, so much for coming. Thank you for coming in person. Thank you for coming online. Um, thanks again to the IPK uh, for making this happen. Um, and thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you so, so much. Round of applause. <laughs> Thank you for having me. This was a real this was a real treat.